pleasure for me to introduce, uh, to introduce uh, Bruce Sterling, uh, even if he, he do doesn't need to be introductive, especially here in Share Festival in Turin. And uh, this is um, a very particular uh, moment, uh, this uh, lec Lectio Magistralis, this is a translation of key keynotes, uh, about uh, ce the celebration of uh, the, cent the, the centenary of uh, Alan Turing. And that's, we are in late, so thank you, Bruce. Go on. Great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm still Lorenzo. Okay, that's great. So, uh, you know, here I am, and thank you for coming. Um, I was asked to talk about Alan Turing. This is Alan. That's the young Alan in his sailor suit. He was born in 1912. So this is his centenary year. After 100 years, this is what you look like. Um, he has many honors now, besides this uh, famous statue in Manchester. He has a plaque on the house where he was born. There's an award named after him, the Turing Award in Computer Science. There's an Alan Turing Institute in Britain. There's an Alan Turing Science Center. There's the Charitable Turing Foundation. All right, I was two months old when Alan Turing died. And of course, his end was a famous tragedy. It was not a happy end for this very, very famous man. He put poison into an apple, he ate the apple, and he died. He committed suicide. Uh, so, you know, in order to tell his story, you have to tell the story about a genius whose work was very influential, who nevertheless met a very melancholy end. It's just a very sad story. So, you know, our, our present day world has, has emerged from some of his ideas about computation, like Turing machines and so forth, and, and the instantiation of, of his ideas in, in genuine machinery like this laptop here. Uh, so we like to say now that we would have treated him better. We love geeky computer geniuses in the year 2012. We really adore them, and we're even kind of fond of cryptographers. He was a cryptographer, so you know, as long as the cryptographer is not Julian Assange, who's being you know cooped up in a London embassy right now, we're actually pretty kind to cryptographers, and we tolerate gay people. And you know, Alan Turing was very gay, so you know, Alan Turing would have been just fine with us. So we would like to say, well, you know, with us he would have been fine, and it was an earlier era that, that punished him. But, but I worry about that version of history because I don't think it's true. Basically, we're just telling ourselves that we're really pretty great and that the people in the past were wrong and bad, and I don't believe that's true. I mean, it overlooks what happens to people among us who were really truly, severely strange thinkers, just really odd people. Alan Turing was a genius. He really thought in some very unusual ways. He was a hard man for even mathematicians to understand. He was really a weird geek. And he got some respect for his intellectual accomplishments, but he never found much in the way of public warmth or approval, or real human sympathy. He was just an odd, queer guy. Now, if you study his biography, the emotional vacuum in his personal life is quite frightening. He, his parents were absent on another continent most of the time. He was sent away to British boarding schools. He lived in academia. Then he joined the intelligence services. His entire life became a secret. He couldn't really confide in anybody, tell people what his life work was about. And of course, he was gay, and he was living in the closet. He had this sort of secret sexual perversion, as they would have called it at the time, that haunted him all his life. Uh, from childhood, a lot of his life was very secret, very isolated. And he was a very bright, 
very physically strong guy. He was like an Olympic class athlete. He could really run. He was powerful, strongly built human being. And he was capable of tremendous hard work. He could really, really concentrate and, and, and bear down on a problem. He was tireless, but he never got much credit for it. And he died in obscurity. There were very few people at his funeral. He was making some superhuman efforts to connect to people, to kind of fit in and find some affection in the world, but he just didn't seem to know the secret words to connect to humanity. So, you know, how strange was Alan Turing? Was he a frightening person? Was he, was he scary? Well, he was a spy. He was a cryptographer and an eavesdropper, and he worked for a secret high-tech military intelligence operation. Yeah, he's a pretty strange guy. I mean, imagine, I'm a science fiction writer. Let's try a thought experiment. Let's imagine Alan Turing is not British. Imagine he's Italian. He's, he's Alan Turingini, <laughs> right? Um, he's not a Bletchley co Park code breaker. He's, he's an Italian code maker, Professor Turinigi. So Professor Turinigi works for the Italian Army's intelligence agency in Rome because that's who the Italian code breakers were. They had 50 people in the Italian code breaking establishment and they were using IBM punch card machines to try to break people's codes and they broke quite a few of them. They broke the Yugoslav code, the Egyptian code, some American diplomatic codes. Um, their most success came from their group Section P. Section P were a black bag unit and they would break into embassies and simply copy the code books. Which is, when you think about it, is a great hack. I mean, why go to all this mathematical trouble to build these gigantic machines? You can simply sneak in there, you know, in the dark and copy the code book. So, Professor Turinigi is a genius, just like Alan Turing, so he realizes that the German Enigma machine has a flaw. And he tries to tell them, of course, he says, look, the Axis should build a secure digital communication system, and I'm a genius and I know how to invent it. I'm Dottori Turinigi. I can build the world's best code-breaking system here in Italy if you'll only give me maybe 500 people and enough money to build a battleship. I'll just build a gigantic colossus and we'll crack all the Allied codes. All right, no one in fascist Italy would have done that for him. That would not have happened. They would have told him, look, Professor Turinigi, obviously you're a great mathematician, you're very bright, we'll give you a medal, maybe you can have a bigger office, but you can't have such huge resources from our government to build a gigantic, untested, colossal device. That's not how we fight wars in Italy. It doesn't make any sense to us. The regime is fighting for its life. We can build a battleship, we can build more tanks. We don't need to build your bizarre device here. You know, do your best as a small scale intellectual artisan. Here's a slide rule, go off and do it. So you can imagine Dr. Turinigi, he would have done his best. He's the mathematics genius. He's a computer pioneer. So he, had, he would have had some success. He would have broken some more codes on a smaller scale, but you know, not enough to win the war. And then after the war, he would have probably messed around with Olivetti and tried to go into the electronic business. And then he would have been involved in a moral scandal and he would have committed suicide. So, you know, that would be Dr. Turinigi. And what would we think of him? I mean, it would be his centenary now. Would he be a hero like Alan Turing? Even if he published the same papers with the Turing discovery and the Turing computation, if he'd done the same mathematics, would he be an international hero and a person for who has statues and all the rest of this? No. No, we'd consider him a very sinister figure. He would be the very scary 
Axis spy and eavesdropper, Dr. Turanigi, a loyal fascist. He'd be a spooky, creepy villain. He'd show up in spy thriller movies about World War II. You know, he'd like have his collar up and he'd be a very frightening guy. And as for the famous Turanigi test, you know, trying to tell people apart from machines, the Turanigi test, that would also have the taint of fascist culture. We'd consider it some kind of interrogation chamber, like torture for machines. That's how scary Alan Turing was. Now, Alan Turing had the good luck to be born on the historical winning side of the war. That's pretty easy. But he also did have the bad luck of being a consistently eccentric, shadowy, obscure, closeted, weird guy. He was never able to just frankly tell people the truth about himself, what he was, what he really desired, what he did, what he wanted to do. He couldn't tell those people those things. And eventually that destroyed him. And I think our world has many people like him right now. We may have more people like him than any culture has ever had. We, have, we don't have many who are as brilliant as him, but we have a lot who are as isolated as him. Uh, and rather than apologizing to Alan Turing after his death and going on and on about his brilliance and how influential he was, I think, I wish we had some way to reach out to other Alan Turings, people who are our own contemporaries, to find people like him. I wish we had some way to convince them to put down the poisoned apple, not to despair of life, not to succumb to crisis and depression, not kill yourself, find a way to live. And we don't have any way to know which Alan Turing's among us will leave some grand legacy in a hundred years. We, we can't prejudge that. We do have plenty of geeks who are just as obsessive and hung up on weird hacks as he was. In fact, we meet a lot of such people in the electronic art world. They're pretty common. I don't think we meet their human needs very well. I think these people suffer. We test them. We try to see if we can get some way for them to start big companies or make a lot of money for us. We're not very considerate of them. It's like really bright, but limited, unusual, troubled people who are sort of wandering sideways through the world, you know, a world they never built. I mean, you know these people, I've met them. Well, let me talk a little bit about Alan Turing's famous test, the imitation game, the Turing test, because I think it's an important metaphysical problem and I think we've always gotten it wrong. I really think it's a difficulty that we, we just never got. So, let's see if I can find Alan number four here. Um, that's it. This is the Turing test. The famous sketch of the Turing test. So, you know, everybody thinks they know what this Turing test is. It's a man and he's talking to a computer and the computer is trying to convince him that it's not a machine. That's the test, you're supposed to pass the test. The computer convinces you that it's human. And if the computer is intelligent enough to do that, then it's artificially intelligent, right? If he talks like a man and he knows what a man knows and he presents as a man and he convinces you as a man, then we don't have to really get into the metaphysical issues of what's really going on in the black box. We just don't ask the question, do you really think? He keeps up the facade, and therefore he's one of us. He's passed. He's perfectly fine. That's the Turing test, as people usually describe it. He said he was a man, I believed him. Okay, he's artificially intelligent. Let's forget the rest of the problem. But that's not what Alan Turing actually said in his original paper on the subject. That's not what he said at all. The real Turing imitation game is about gender politics. It's all about being a transvestite. It's about a machine imitating a woman, 
Not a machine imitating a man. In the original Turing imitation game, you've got three entities. You have the judge, guy who's administering the test, and you have a real woman, and then you have a machine pretending to be a woman. That's what the test is. Now, it's easy to claim that this test, this imitation game, is actually all about Alan Turing. He's a closeted gay man. It's Alan Turing who's the brilliant machine in the closet. It's, it's wish fulfillment, it's a metaphor. Turing is a man talking like a computer, but he really wants to be understood as a woman. Now, that's, that's tragic, and there may even be some truth to it, but it's too simple. I really wish this particular part of Alan Turing's puzzle, this test, had been played up from the very beginning. Because it's like Alan Turing said, it doesn't really help to ask, does a machine think? You really want some other kind of test. So why not ask his original question, not can there be artificial intelligence, but can a computational system be a woman? Not an artificial intelligence, a woman. Now, you know, this sounds absurd, which is why we never really thought about his idea very much. We never confronted that. If you look at all the many attempts at Turing tests over the years, you don't see many machines pretending to be girls. They're not pretending to be girls. You know, it's Alan is kind of sailing that queer sea of thought all by himself. But, you know, since I'm a science fiction writer, let's go ahead and imagine this hypothetical situation all about being a woman. You got three women. They're communicating by email. There's a woman, the judge, and there's another woman, the real woman, and then there's this third entity who is a computational system presenting as a woman. What are they really going to do? I mean, what are they, these three women really going to talk about? Are they going to talk about philosophy? and metaphysics? No, they're not. They're going to talk like women. They're, and the two women are going to feel immediate deep sympathy and solidarity with this tortured alien creature here who so much wants to be a woman but has zero chance of having a woman's lived experience. This entity is a woman who will never be loved by anyone. She's never a wife. A sister, a mother, a daughter, all those roles are close to her. She never nurtured anyone. She never danced, never sang a song, never felt the sun on her skin. Cannot comfort a weeping child. Cannot weep at the graveside of her parents. Never got a smile, never received a compliment, never saw her own face in the mirror. What kind of woman is that? These abstract arguments would melt away. They just fall by the wayside. The immediate human question would be, how can we do justice for our wounded sister, this talking machine? Why have we done such violence to her nature by forcing her into this position of deceit? What is her nature, anyway, since she's obviously not a woman? How can we liberate her from this closet and allow her to express what she is? What is she really? Nobody's asked that question. It merely demands that she pretend to be something else. But what about her actual authenticity when she's not dressing up in drag and pretending to be a transvestite woman? What kind of entity is this thing really? All right, we don't ask those questions. We never asked them. We never got over the misunderstanding of Alan Turing's test. As metaphysicians, we still like to pretend that computers are like independent organisms, black boxes in closets like this. But you know, our computers don't behave like this anymore. They're not standalone devices with a brain inside. That's not what this computer is about or any computer. Are there any of the computers in your, in your purses and pockets? They're all networked devices now. They're not independent individuals. 
We have networks of computation. Our devices don't stand alone in a closet waiting to prove that they're human. We have clouds and social networks. That's what computation's about. Siri can talk. If you want a computer to talk, you can talk to Siri on your phone. And Siri is a system that pretends to be a woman. It's got a woman's voice. Siri can answer questions, all kinds of interesting questions. But Siri is also answering questions no woman can answer. Siri is answering thousands of questions at once. No woman can do that. Now, if we thought that Siri was art an artificial intelligence, if we thought that Siri was a conscious entity, she would not suddenly be a woman. She would not be our metaphysical equal, just like us. Siri is an entity of a different order than a woman. Behaving completely, it would be trivial to devote more computational resources to Siri and make Siri 10 times bigger, or Siri 100 times faster, Siri times 1,000. We could also slow Siri down by a factor of a thousand so that she talked and thought very, very slowly. But she'd still be Siri. She'd still be the same entity. Women can't do that. We don't do that with the cognition systems inside our heads. That's not how cognition works. Now, cognition exists and computation exists, but they're not the same thing. They're not metaphysical equals. There are a lot of dynamic, complex network systems in the world now. And we can't ask them all to be women unless they're actually women. So if I were to reframe Alan Turing's question along modern lines, the problem would look different, although just as interesting. I would ask, OK, what really is computation? And what really is cognition? And what genuine similarities do they really have? And what are their genuine differences? In what circumstances should they be brought together? And in what circumstances should they be kept apart? And I would struggle to approach this from a position of sympathy and empathy rather than as an inquisition. Like, you system, be a woman. No, you system, be what you are, what are you? Now, if you ask an, any undergraduate student to talk about thinking and machines, he's going to immediately turn to Wikipedia. So what is Wikipedia? And how come every student in the world is cribbing from this thing, even if you tell your student, don't use Wikipedia? Well, Wikipedia is very important, a very powerful source of knowledge, but obviously not a woman. Wikipedia is not Wikipedia. <laughs> no, she's a structure, a structured database, but she's also a huge agglomeration of effective human effort. There's just a lot of human creativity in Wikipedia. It's all written by people. It's just organized through a wiki structure. You know, to say that Wikipedia is a machine or a computer is like saying that the Greco-Roman concordance, you know, our, our heritage from, from Greece and Rome, literary heritage, is, all, is some kind of machine. It just, it just isn't. Wikipedia is not a tool like a hammer or a wheelbarrow. It's a thing made by thousands of people over many years of work. It's like the city of Torino, really just kind of a gigantic you know, organization. It's like the European railway system. That's what Wikipedia is like. It's not human, but it deserves some tenderness and respect. Now, I happen to be an artificial intelligence skeptic. I thought for a long time the cognition and computation are different entities. That's why code is great at stuff like recursion and simulation, and cognition is great at things like embodying femininity. And I think we'd make a lot of progress if we took a cue from Alan Turing and just replace this term intelligence with femininity every time that we can. Artificial femininity. 
You know, as soon as you say that, you realize, wait a minute, you know, there's a confusion here. But, you know, explain to me, if you're an engineer, software engineer, why is it important to build systems with artificial intelligence and yet you don't build artificial femininity? What's that about? Do you really believe that cognition is a quality strictly divorced from gender? Like intelligence is what's really there and like sexuality is some kind of accident? How can you properly claim that you know how human brains work if you can't create a system that expresses a female sexual identity? Because they do. That's what brains do. They do that. In fact, it's not a rare thing. Women are the majority gender. Most people are women. Where is that aspect of human intelligence hiding? Is femininity non-algorithmic? Is it a magic quality that can't be captured in code? Is femininity a Turing non-computable problem? Where are you going to hide that particular peanut? You know? Where are you going to obscure that reality of our existence? You know, sexuality is eons older than intelligence. There was a lot of sex going on before there was any human consciousness. We're not abstract mathematical systems who are somehow burdened by gender. That's not what we are. We're living entities produced by sexual means. These are the facts of life. That's where we came from. We didn't come out of math land. We don't know how cognition really works. It wouldn't surprise me to learn that sexual hormones like estrogen and testosterone are fundamental to cognition. People think with these hormones, they're part of the brain. They're probably part of conscious self-awareness. We shouldn't say that we know what thinking is or what cognition is when we don't have the evidence to back up these assertions. We should have a spirit of humble inquiry and not decide things through metaphysical tricks like Turing's puzzle. We do not understand how we think. We should be braced for some disturbing revelations there. I think we will learn how we think. Not all of it, but we're going to learn more and more. We pretend that we know what intelligence is and we pretend we can build an artificial kind of intelligence, but we've never succeeded. And we forget that Alan Turing was extremely intelligent, really, really intelligent guy, strong, hardworking, very enduring. But he despaired of life and killed himself because they shot him up with estrogen. They gave him female hormones and a tr an apparent treatment for his homosexuality, and his intelligence brought him no comfort. He was not able to reason his way out of that predicament. His brain was full of injected hormones. He wrote his will and he killed himself. Okay, Turing's suicide is part of his legacy. It's not something we should ignore. It's a warning to us that mathematics and software do not make us masters of the meaning of life. We don't think about a feminine artificial intelligence because we don't think right about intelligence. And we also overlook a suicidal artificial intelligence. Even though the very founder of the concept was an effeminate suicidal guy. Why are AIs supposed to have consciousness and have no wish for death? Why, what are we trying to conceal from ourselves with that assumption? We've never had one. Why do we think it would not want to die? Machines have an awareness which can never aspire toward non-awareness? What kind of awareness is that? We should beware of arrogant metaphysical assertions that ignore the lessons of lived experience. For instance, AIs don't have any lived experience. They're not born, they don't grow, 
they don't age. Supposedly, they're thinking, self-aware machines whose passage through time and space changes them in no way. They're just code and hardware. They can run backwards as well as forward. When they make up their mind, they can unmake their mind through the same software process. But what kind of awareness is that? So, having beaten that particular horse, let me change the subject and talk about another legacy of Alan Turing, his important legacy for the art world. Let's talk about creative work that's performed with computation or with systems or with algorithms or with networks. Art that has arisen from the world that he pioneered. So here's a contemporary problem, typical of problems I have. I'm very, very interested in computational machinery. I have some particular darlings, such as processing code, Arduino control boards, fabricators, machine vision systems, reactive sensors, motion control sensors, augmented reality gizmos. They're all over my blog, very up to date on this, very aware of that world, very interested. But I'm not a computer scientist. I'm not a mathematician. I'm not even a metaphysician. I'm an art critic. I'm a technology art critic. I'm a contemporary tech art critic. Every day I face these unstable heaps of creative machinery. Sometimes they claim they're a woman. I'm not concerned about that. I'm on Twitter. I get female spam bots pretending to be women all every day. I go over to Second Life. There's all kinds of entities wandering around, vector map graphics, pretending to be women, avatars of women, gaming women. And just very common now, not even very interesting, never fool me, it doesn't bother me, not, a, not an issue. My problem comes when you're an artificial woman artist. Now that's tougher because now we're right back into the Turing test interrogation cells. So like, who did the work? Is it the machine or is it the artist? Okay, and this time perhaps the person in the machine maybe Yoko Ono or Marina Abramovich here. So let's imagine it's Marina Abramovich and I started asking her innocent Turing style questions like, please tell me Marina, are you really a woman? And she just sits there staring into space for six solid hours, maybe bleeding a little bit. Okay, that's Marina Abramovich, one of the greatest women artists of our time super with her artistic presence, her embodiment issues. She's just right there with you in the room with the body. Oh, and that's her art. So Marina passes the Turing test, doesn't say a word. I've got other problems with computers and creativity. For instance, let's say I'm an art critic and I'm running an art film festival and I've got a slot for video motion graphics in my show. I got two video artists, contemporary multimedia video artists. I've got to give one the prize. This is my job, I'm the judge. So I've got artist number one. She's a coder, great coder. Writes software code, expresses these graphics. She really gets it about algorithms. She's got a deep, intimate understanding of the behavior of graphics code. She's a virtuoso. And I've got her rival who knows nothing about code, scarcely cares about it. She's a wacky punk artist. She uses nothing but off-the-shelf GIF graphics and, and Photoshop effects. However, her graphics are hilarious. They're really like vivid and captivating. She's got no virtuosity, but she has a lot of expressive passion. Now, they're both worthy artists, or I, but they can't both win. I've got to make the choice. I have to make a value judgment. And at its basis, it's an Alan Turing issue. It's something he brought to us. What's the relationship between the cognition systems of these artists, these two women, these human beings, and the computational systems that are their means of expression? Which one is the better artist? What is their relationship as artists to these machines that they're using? 
Should I valorize the one who really understands the machine? Or should I valorize the one who really expresses herself with the machine? You know, in some ways, it's a traditional art critic problem. It's like we say music critics and violinists. You got this elderly virtuoso violin guy. He's flawless, you know, but just kind of sawing away, not real concerned. And then you got to have his nephew, who's a wild man, can't play very well, but he's really bringing the house down. You know, like, people are really just, it's a matter of taste. As time passes, the young wild man's going to become the bored, elderly, virtuoso. That's what human beings are like. But computational systems aren't violins. They don't behave like that. If you leave the classical concert hall with the violinists and you go hang out with dubstep techno musician guys, then you'll see the Turing relationship again. Techno people have a maniacal fever to invent riffs. That's what they do, just signature bleeps, riffs, squawks, honks, you know, unique noises. The greatest techno musicians are not great technicians. They're not super coders, and they're not the greatest musicians either. The greatest techno musicians, I'm pretty sure, are the guys who are able to place themselves into just the right relationship with the machines. They're just techno enough. They create a techno social space when they perform. They're the ones who are techno in just the right way at just the right time. Great techno music is a set of relationships to the machines that arouses a response in the public's own relationships to the machines. They're getting an aesthetic free song from watching you or hearing you maneuver through this field of sonic machine relationships. That's sort of the joy of techno music. And if you don't see this in techno music, if you don't perceive it, it's like failing to hear syncopation in jazz. You're just not experiencing it as what it is. And furthermore, there's always a fear in the audience that the DJ has already left. There is no technical reason why he can't just pre-record his performance and sneak off backstage and get high instead of coming in to you know, engage in these techno social maneuvers. It's the Milli Vanilli terror. It's really the Turing imitation game by another word. It's the fake that stole this aura of performing authenticity. You've been taken in by the machine. Where did the artist go? What if it's all machines? There are endless small variations of this in the tech art world. Brian Eno, for instance, has a generative art system called 77 million paintings. There are no paintings in that system. Basically, the thing is a screensaver. That's what Eno built. If it were downloadable for free as a screensaver, nobody would be excited about it. But as an installation called 77 Million Paintings, Brian Eno can tour the world with this work of art. And it's not an imposture. Brian Eno's a great artist. Different thoughts go through your head. You have a different social experience when you know you're watching an Eno installation. Eno himself has not seen all the images in 77 Million Paintings. Nobody ever will. That doesn't bother anybody. It's part of the charm of the work. It doesn't matter what kind of machines Eno is using. Nobody asks him. He's Eno. He's the maestro. You don't ask about his projector or his computer. But you can go into a gallery today with a Nam June Pike installation from the 1970s. And you'll find the curator very worried because Nam June Pike used Sony analog TV vacuum tube sets. That's what Nam June Pike built his video art with. They're video installations. The museum bought the TV sets. That's the work. They've got provenance. 
They're part of the museum system. Nam Joon Pike is dead. You can't rip out these defunct TV sets and put in flat screens. It's not allowed. It's violating a social contract. It's destroying the artwork. You are willfully destroying the artistic achievement of Nam June Pike, who placed himself into a certain equilibrium with these TV sets. You've destroyed a statement he made, and you've put in a different statement if you replace those devices. The exact opposite of the Eno situation. How to resolve this irrational paradox, I don't know. But it's really a big critical issue. It's part of the fun of it, really. Art conjures up the open-endedness of life. We may never have a perfect definition of that. The proportions of human experience are generous. There are plenty of reasons to make art with all kinds of devices and services. Art critics know all these reasons. If we run out of reasons, we can always invent more. The issue is this intimate participation of machinery and art making. That's what's really different now. Practically everything that we do in this era, this decade, that is novel and different has some kind of computational flavor. It's just come out of that world. It's been ages since anybody invented an exciting new oil pigment or you know, an amazing new kind of guitar string. That's just not where we innovate. But we're always inventing forms of creative practice that are basically co-discovery with machines. New things to do with platforms, systems, networks, the cloud, the net. We, we, are, we are inexhaustible. And typically, it works in a predictable way in music, in architecture, in web design, in interaction design, even in manufacturing now. There are certain things that we do. We have compositional systems. They arrive as a collection of standards, of presets, buttons to push. Then somebody articulates a gesture. He actually tries something out. It's like, I'm going to begin. They feed something in there, maybe just an impulse, an intuition, whatever. They see what happens, then they tweak it. It's like, no, that's not quite right. They see what directions it seems to be going in. They're like moving the slider bar, modulating the parameters, just like maneuvering through the system. They're looking for some optimum setting where things seem to get the best results and not too many ugly glitches and bugs. And then they wrap that up and they ship it. And it doesn't matter if it's music, architecture, web design, or manufacturing. It's just become the way we work. It doesn't matter if it's a skyscraper or an MP3 track. That's how we do it. And if they're of a certain cultural caste, they'll even open source the art and leave it for anybody else to modify. And obviously that has very profound effects on critical issues such as craftsmanship, who really did it, how do we know they're good at it, originality, claims to authorship, who made Wikipedia. How do we critically assess these creative products of many thousands of brains and hands? And what problems we have with these machines we've built? They're not stable. They're not like violins. They're not like brushes or oil paint. They are becoming swarms, clouds, clusters, bunches, arrays, aggregates. I have a personal computer. Here it is. I don't do much on this machine that's truly personal. I would never dream of asking it a, a, a personal question like, hey, laptop, come va? That, that, that's not that kind of relationship. So, you know, I'd like to see a future world where our relationship to these entities is more intimate and more honest and less full of errors and phantoms. I don't want to say that Alan Turing was wrong. His legacy is wrong. That's not the proper thing to say. He was mistaken, but so are we. And 
we're just as wrong as he was, but for much higher stakes. These things that he called computers were just a few feeble electromechanical systems, barely existing. We have billions of them doubling in power every 18 months. Now, Alan Turing was a pioneer. There's no shame in being lost when you're discovering new territory. That was his fate. But I feel that in many ways, we're not living up to his legacy. We're not really exploring what he was trying to explore. We've settled for easy answers. And the electronic art world is closeted. We really choose to live in the mists of his metaphysics. We're not entirely honest about our weird relationship with all these devices and systems, our love for them, our willingness to embrace them, the oddity of the life that we've chosen. We don't step into daylight. We don't directly confront the aesthetic issues and really the relationship issues that we have to these devices and objects and services. It's not that we're stupid. I think perhaps we're too clever. We've kind of thought it out too much. Posterity will judge us for failing to speak about the obvious in a lucid and simple way. Just own up to it somehow. Where is the art? Where, where is the presence of the artist? What's the relationship of the human and these unstable systems? What is the nature of the new aesthetic? What is it that we really want? What is our relationship with the beautiful? What, is our, what about our illicit relationship to these non-human platforms and systems? Maybe it's embarrassing, but it is the truth. If it's really the truth, it can't really be that bad. Just own up to it. I mean, we managed to make Alan Turing world famous, even though he died alone and obscure. But the devices that he built are not alone and obscure. They're, they're the most widespread technology ever. Everybody sees computers. Everybody's got handheld devices. They're not secret spy devices in some hidden area. They're absolutely parts of everyday common life. And yet, people in the electronic art world still behave almost like a covert organization. They're like a cultural minority. They don't honestly look in their own face in the mirror. They don't really have a mirror. They have a kaleidoscope. You know, we have to learn to look at our own face in an unstable kaleidoscope, something that just changes all the time. But I think, I think we can do it. You know, I think it's probably a simpler thing than we think. I think the moment will come when we like get our heads around it somehow and like actually have like a workable, everyday, sensible relationship. You know, just, just a sensibility that somehow heals all of Alan Turing's secret wounds. You know, just a new and, and better way to get by. Thank you very much.